Architecture in the Great Confinement is an interview series organized by the University of Miami School of Architecture in an effort to promote a global dialogue focused on the recent events surrounding the COVID-19 virus and the effects that these events may have on the world of architecture and on the future design of our cities. My name is Carrie Penabad, and I am the Associate Dean and Director of Undergraduate Programs at the school. My recent conversations have been varied. They present the initial impressions, the observations, the opinions of the participants, and in no way are they conclusive. However, having lost our ability to physically connect on our campus through lectures, conferences, symposiums, and even informal gatherings in many of our classrooms and design studios, we hope that this new series will provide us a new means to connect. We also hope that both our local and our global community will weigh in. We look forward to hearing your feedback and your commentary on the conversation so that this initiative can promote a more meaningful and sustained dialogue. Finally, and most importantly, we hope that all of you watching this series are at home, safe, and well. And we look forward to the ability to gather once again in the very near future in our cities and on our campus. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Today is Sunday, April 5th, and I'm here with Nader Tarani. Nader, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to talk to me. My uh, pleasure. Good to see you again. It's good to see you too. So Nader, where are you now? And uh, how have the recent events surrounding the COVID-19 virus affected the structure of your life and your work? Uh, I'm sitting in my apartment in the south end of Boston, across from um, Boston Medical Center. Uh, I've been here in the same apartment since 1997, but now I lead a dual life between here and New York City, where I serve as the Dean of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture. In short, uh, last time uh, I've been in New York City was about exactly three weeks ago. Uh, at which point uh, we were disbanding for spring break, knowing fully well that we are probably not going to be coming back because we're going to be taking everything online. In fact, the situation was already somewhat precarious while I was in New York City because one of our faculty members was ill though he had not been tested yet, positive at the time, we understood what the implications could be if we continued with the crits. So some of the final reviews were done already on Zoom. And I had started testing out the virtual experience uh, the week before, even though we were there physically in the same space. Mm -hmm. Some people were in their offices, other people in studios. We were trying to figure out what does this new modality mean in terms of our interface? Now that's obvious to you and me in the context of practice because we've been doing WebExes and Zoom meetings for many years now. But I think in the context of projects, commissions, where the challenge and the object of the game is very well defined, it's much more goal oriented. In the context of the academy, uh, if I'm not wrong, or if you agree with me, uh, the intent is always to open up questions, to speculate, to explore, and to experiment. And, uh, and the ability to set up a casual environment in the context of a crit or a social environment where everybody's together produces the illusion that one can actually do that without the interface of this picture plane that divides us right now. Um, so part of the difficulty of the moment, at least in the context of the design studio, is to, is to figure out how is it that we get to 
use uh, this interface, this instrument, as a productive way to explore problems of representation in so far as representation becomes the conduit through which architectural thinking is able to happen. And have so, you, sorry, I don't know. No, I was curious to know if you had received any feedback from your faculty now that they're about maybe a week and a half or two weeks in, particularly those that are teaching design, and if they've shared any, you know, if they've given you any feedback thus far. There are some anecdotes, and they are interesting, and they align somewhat well with uh, those areas of interest that I have. Um, for many years now, uh, I've been arguing that when you do WebExes, you should turn off the cameras and use the paper, the, the drawing that you are doing, as the point of conversation, because the drawings that you do on that existing drawing uh, is the medium through which ideas get communicated. The, that tenuous and delicate relationship between words and images, uh, words and representations uh, are where the action is. It, is it, it has very little to do with the expression on your face or your body language. Of course, that too, but that's for other reasons. And in other words, I'm not, I'm trying to displace the, the centrality of us uh, in a human conversation. I'm, I'm trying to define the discursive space within which an architectural discussion tends to happen. And that's something that the students don't get to experience, ironically, in a crit, because people are too afraid to go up to a drawing and draw over a drawing. That has become a taboo in recent years. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, without hesitation, somebody would pick up a pencil and draw it on your, on your sheet. And now they don't do that. And so the idea that Zoom allows for this kind of casual interface has been a very uh, productive uh, two weeks for us. The second has been something that is unique to Cooper Union, which probably is different at UM. We team teach, and that means that there's three faculty members and about 30 students in reviews, which is great because it's a public event. Uh, it is spirited as a debate. It's not a point of view. It's at least three to 33 points of uh, view. And, uh, the challenge of that is how to bring the intimacy of individuated conversations to the fore. Uh, and what Zoom has done is that it's created um, an avenue to do both and. So our reviews now start in larger forums of 30 people where larger issues are hashed out. And then uh, they retire into three different rooms and each professor takes on and opens up a different room. And then students are allowed to migrate from room to room according to their projects, uh, their intellectual interests, and their friends. And the students are migrating between all of these rooms. And what happens is that as you break down these conversations into smaller teams of students of five to 10 students at any given moment, the people that would normally be sitting in the back of the room have ended up coming to the front uh, because it's less intimidating to have that discussion and they are much more part of the conversation. Mm. So the, the possibility and the imperative to engage in a more intimate scale has also become uh, possible. Now, it would seem that I'm trying to sell the product here and I, I'm, I'm certainly not. It, it has many challenges. Uh, it takes twice the amount of time. It, it makes viewing models virtually impossible. It's difficult to hold models and 3D models are, are, are difficult to, um, to, to rotate uh, well in Rhino. It's, uh, people are as good as their driving is. If people don't know how to drive a model, they also don't know how to construct an argument through the way that they show it. Uh, so 
it's a very uh, difficult thing, particularly for a teacher that wants to be a backseat driver. I think that uh, you touched upon a lot of the challenges that I think at least, um, I mean, in the world of architectural education, the design studio being the heart of the curriculum has always been the one that people have discussed as being the most challenging in terms of a transition to online education. And so um, I think this is just uh, because of the circumstances caused us to uh, confront that challenge up front. And I think it's causing us to think about both the possibilities as well as the limitations of the medium, as you're pointing out. So I think it'll be good for all of us to compare notes about a month and a half from now to see really what, what might be the best practices to deliver still a meaningful education within this digital platform. I mean, th there are other dangers that are lurking behind these questions uh, because so many schools understand the innate expenses around architectural education being rooted in the real estate expenses of one desk per student, mm. which is not the case in the school of business or in literature or in almost any other field. Uh, but the studio experience is at the heart of this question. And to the extent that uh, schools of architecture in Italy, uh, in France, or, or many other places in the, in the world don't enjoy the studio experience. We understand because of that, the American educational system and its provision of the studio space is a luxury like no other and a model of education that places learning or the moment of learning, not during class, but in all of the relief times between classes, late at night, where peer-to-peer -peer engagement ends up being even more vital than what we learn from top-down instruction. Uh, and so for me, if there's maybe a lesson to be learned from this moment, is how can we radicalize or learn from the, the hybrid ways in which online learning and physical in-space learning can work together to produce something larger than the sum of their parts? Actually, maybe... Or, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Nadia. Go ahead, sorry. No, what I was thinking was that uh, we have other issues that happen in our school where for lecture courses and seminars, we may have three hours of a seminar with lectures that linger for an hour and a half. And often those kinds of lectures tend to uh, be less interactive, uh, inspire less dialogue. Uh, and so, and they go through many ideas through the course of the hour and a half. But if one were able to frame those ideas and be able to compartmentalize them to some degree, it also bears to stand that if they were pre-recorded, students would watch those modules of those lectures in 15, 20 minute uh, bite-sized lectures and re-read -re them, re-listen to them if they didn't understand it so that the class time where they come back together for those three hours or the two extra hours end up being collaborative time, end up being debate time, and then end up being much more engaging uh, as part of that learning experience and something that live teaching never does because live teaching has so many other circumstances. If you pulled an all-nighter for studio, you will be asleep in that lecture. If you had a sleep, sleeping disorder, you will not be alert during that lecture. Uh, if you have a, an exam right after the lecture, you will be studying for that while you're listening to the lecture. All of these things produce temporal constraints that um, the modules of the lecture could relieve you of if you had your own choice to listen to them uh, at odd points of time. So it makes me wonder if a course can benefit from uh, 
devising ways in which what's online and offline end up supporting each other in more strategic ways. Yeah, no, I, I think we're getting some of that feedback um, now down in, at UM, and I've also spoken with others as part of this interview series. So I think you're right. I think the lecture, particularly the lecture courses, seem to be a, a different uh, format altogether, obviously, than the design studio. But I think, I think trying to think in innovative ways where it might not be either or, but it might be both and, I think will be things we'll have to think about moving forward. But I think this, some of your comments is a good segue maybe into the next question, which I think you've started to talk about maybe the future of architectural education, but what impact do you think these recent events um, surrounding the COVID-19 virus will have on the world of architecture, or, or as you were saying, architectural education? Um, and then more importantly, maybe what you think it might have in terms of the design of the future city, if any. Um, given these recent events? Well, I think we've covered a good amount of discussion on the ar architectural education. I just think that sometimes it takes a crisis to, to recognize that we are already living in a different world and this will concretize uh, the presence of the digital uh, and the virtual interface uh, as an emerging dominant force in, in the way that we work uh, for better and for worse, by the way. But I, uh, I, I fear that if it becomes the only uh, vehicle, it, it is much to the worst because there's so much to be learned from the senses. And, and I you know, have not forgotten about uh, the other ways in which we learn from each other, which are central and tactile and uh, uh, and have to do with a, a lot of the other qualities that we bring to a conversation in, in terms of social engagement. Um, in terms of uh, the design of the city and uh, the way in which this changes everything, uh, I guess the prerequisite for that question is, um, you know, you always have to ask the question, what is architectural uh, about any phenomena that we face out there in the world? And in what way is architecture impacted by it? Uh, architecture and urbanism, one could argue, is the one single common denominator that we all face uh, in every shift in policy that has to do with governance. Uh, public spaces, uh, notions of propriety, ownership, uh, the decorum uh, of walking, driving, bicycling, uh, all of the recent shifts that you've seen in behaviors and laws in the city have to do with these incremental shifts that have happened around us. I think there's an interesting thing that's happening right now with uh, the virus. And that is, first of all, that the question of health has become a, a top priority once again. Uh, I don't know if it leads to the path of health insurance as the common denominator, uh, but depending on your political leanings, it's going to be the Achilles heel of the United States. Uh, and if you think of health as a civil right, uh, as, a, uh, as much like clean water or education or, or basic civil rights, uh, where does health belong in that equation? Um, depending on how many deaths uh, this incident involves, and depending on how the U.S. internalizes the gravity uh, of this situation and its propensity to occur again, uh, this may impact the way that uh, health is once again brought back into a, uh, its political actions. To the extent that health also becomes a mechanism of control, that's another uh, vivid possibility that uh, you know, the, the passport that you go through uh, 
usually has your citizenship, it, it has your place of birth, it has your age. Uh, it rarely states, if, if ever, the state of your health. And I think that uh, that may become one of the most single and radical transformations of moving bodies across borders uh, and ways of controlling uh, customs and controlling uh, uh, actions and, and having a lens into the private sphere of your body like never before. Okay. Uh, and certainly this has brought, the general discussion about the pandemic has brought a, a, an incredible uh, focus back on the relationship between the individual and the collective. Uh, consider it like this. We have never been so alone or so isolated as a result of a, an incident that could not be more collective in its nature. Consider also this, uh, never has there been an incident like this that has brought people like you and me together that would not normally not talk to each other even though we are friends. And this simple interface that you and I are having as friends, I've had with two dozen other people with whom I'm as close as I am with you, but I don't have the cause or the inclination or the time even uh, to be able to share this kind of uh, discussion with on a regular basis. Uh, and so uh, it is interesting to note that there are aspects of this experience that are uh, fundamentally about the creation of new civic projects, new collective spaces uh, of discussion and, uh, and overseeing uh, new forms of legislation that have to do with protecting that space. I mean, Within a week of launching on education, we've already seen violations of Zoom access where people have hacked into meetings that, just like the one we're having right now. And they've begun to uh, uh, dabble with and, uh, and, uh, and alter the nature of these meetings by their uh, interventions into them. Hmm. Uh, and that's quite radical. Hmm. Uh, so uh, it comes into spaces of public interface like this will become part of, of our way of seeing the architecture of these spaces uh, as an extension of what we see as the urban realm out there. Now, uh, connecting this to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the space of the campus. Um, many people ask the question, will online learning kill um, the education of campuses? Uh, I suspect not. What will change is the perception of those spaces. So for instance, if Harvard's population is five or 10,000 people right now, I don't know exactly what it is, as student populations go, the online learning platform stands to multiply that by 10. Uh, and all of a sudden you have 100,000 people benefiting from a Harvard education. They will never get the same experience, but they will get the same courses. But there's something unique about uh, the social interaction that happens in the serendipity of happenstance and, and being able to commingle uh, and interact with people, which is something that you and I have experienced in a very particular way on the trays at the GSD. That 
your cubicle is a very private space where you're doing your work, but you're always part of a large collective theater uh, that brings what you're doing into a political discussion as a public forum. Uh, and I think that um, the presence of campuses as an extension of the public realm in being able to hold uh, those kinds of discussions that have formal, spatial, and material consequences uh, have a lot to do with the future of education. Insofar uh, as cities, uh, their infrastructures, the manipulation of the landscape have so much to do with uh, uh, what is a common denominator for everything that uh, impacts society, from housing uh, to public transportation to uh, areas of commerce to shopping to the definition of a community and the scale uh, that it inspires. Uh, these things will remain uh, quite vivid, uh, even more so now when we recognize that our access to a supermarket is at once so vital, but mediated through six feet of space, mediated through uh, certain temporal restrictions as you have to wait to be able to enter into a supermarket before you can also go out, and all of the other new kinds of protocols that these involve. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a deeply architectural experience, uh, I, I think, this moment. Yes, I think you're right uh, about that. And, and what I'm hoping is that this time gives you the opportunity to move into spaces and projects that you might otherwise not have had the opportunity to do. And I am grateful for, um, I think there are always gifts, even among crisis, and being able to connect uh, like this with colleagues and friends from all over the globe and share your perspective on the things that matter to so many of us in the architectural community, uh, I'm grateful for. So thank you again, Nader, for taking a few minutes to speak with me today. And I hope you are safe and well, and I look forward to continuing to compare notes over the next couple of months.